If you've got your dad, I say this on Mother's Day as well, that some of you know what we're talking about. Uh, if you've still got your dad, don't take him for granted because there will come a day when you'll give anything if you could just sit in his company and um, enjoy just being with him a little bit. So if you still got him, don't take him for granted. <clears throat> if they're with Jesus, celebrate that one day you'll get to sit down with him again. Amen? Amen. Well, I'm not going to preach a Father's Day sermon. I'm going to continue preaching the series on why you're so holy. <laughs> Isn't that great? <clears throat> Do you feel holy? I got my work cut out for me. I believe that God, through Jesus Christ, has made us holy. If, if we're not holy, we can't go to heaven, so we're holy, right? When God looks at me through the righteousness of Christ, He qualifies me to go to heaven. He qualifies you to go to heaven. And so, as being holy and faithful brothers and sisters in Christ, started off Colossians a few weeks ago talking to you about what it means to be holy and faithful because of what Jesus did, not what you did. It's your position toward God in Christ that when He looks at you, He sees the sacrifice of Jesus and He qualifies you as being holy and faithful. So as it begins the first chapter, there's some things that we need to know as holy and faithful brothers and sisters. First of all is that we are in Christ holy and faithful. And they all said, secondly, your best qualities are faith and love. It's the best thing about you that you have faith and love. Talked about that last week. And that you are the fruit of the gospel. The gospel is creating this righteousness if we just protect it and nurture it. And they all said, that's the review. Now today I want to tell you the fourth thing that you need to know as a holy and faithful servant of Jesus Christ is that you need, we need a spiritual mind. Now we were positionally toward God made holy and faithful because of what Jesus did and now we're going to try to live out that holy and faithful identity and that's going to require a spiritual mind. You know how to speed a preacher up? Do you? Show me you're getting it. So follow along here very closely, Colossians chapter 1, verse 9. You've got a sermon section, right? And you've got the app with the sermon notes in it, don't we, Tiffany? <laughs> we realize you were, a couple, you were short at a couple of points uh, last week. We have dealt with that very severely. <clears throat> we have docked pay and, and scourged all those involved. And uh, we think we've got that problem solved going forward. You need a spiritual mind, so let's talk about how you're going to have this spiritual mind. Here we are in verse 9, the apostle writes, For this reason, since the day we heard about you, we've not stopped praying for you and asking God, now he's about to, I believe, describe a spiritual mind, asking God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all spiritual wisdom and understanding that God would fill you with the knowledge of His will through all spiritual wisdom and understanding. How many of you today are filled with the knowledge of God's will? Your mind just full of the knowledge of God's will. Again, I've got some work to do, haven't I? You're just full of the knowledge of God's will. Can I, can I give you a, a, a 35-second theology lesson before I start in, in the application. Only the really smart people are going to get this. The rest of you just tag along and nod and no one will know the difference. But uh, the really intelligent people are about to get a lesson here. In the Assemblies of God, we have this doctrine called sanctification. And sanctification works like this. We say we are sanctified positionally at new birth and progressively as we live with the Lord. That makes sense? We are sanctified positionally at new birth and progressively as we walk with the Lord. What that means is the moment I received Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior, I was cleansed and separated from my sin and qualified for the identity holy and faithful at that very moment simply because I put my faith in Jesus Christ. Are you with me? My 35 seconds is almost gone, so I need you. And then... We say we are sanctified progressively as we walk with the Lord. In other words, I was in my position toward God, sanctified at new birth, but now I am being sanctified in my life. 
I'm being sanctified in my lifestyle. And I'm being sanctified in my thinking. That's, that's theology. So all the smart people understand that. You know, the LDs are going to catch up later. But uh, we, we got it, right? We got it. Let's go. So let's talk about what it means to be sanctified and what it means to have a spiritual mind. The mind of God was designed for you, has the mind of God that has the mind God has designed for you has four specific qualities. We're going to pull them right out of the passage here. The right man mind has been filled by God. I pray that God will fill you. It has been filled by God. Are you listening? The, the, the right mind, the spiritual mind, is not a mind that has traces of God in it, or a hint of God, or a shadow of God. The spiritual mind has been filled by God. The thoughts, the understanding, the orientation the, the way they think, the worldview, has been created by God. It has been filled by God. You see, when our minds have been filled by God, we, we thank God's thoughts after Him. You know, I, I kind of talk like the people I spend time with. Do you ever notice that? Uh, a few years ago, well, it was 2015, you may even know the story, my wife, be, or my wife, my mother, my mother became very ill, and my wife and I traveled back and forth a lot, and we, we after decades of living in Missouri, we were sort of bilocational, we, we would be here on the weekends, we'd be there with mom, and we'd, we'd, we'd run back and forth a lot, almost weekly when she was very sick, so we could be there to help take care of her and, and do our our their jobs. And I noticed after doing that for a while, my kids started saying, Dad, you're starting to talk funny. Your, your southern Arkansas accent is coming back. Which I never knew it left in the first place. But they said, no, no, you're talking a lot slower and, and you're using scene for saw, you know. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Don't laugh, Toby. I hear you do that all the time, you know. I seen that. Do you see that? You know, and we 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 drop off the helping verbs and we just put the the scene at. You know, and you know, because I spent all week with people who talked a certain way, and my ear would catch it without me knowing. I'd begin to talk the way I grew up talking before I hung around all you sophisticated Missourians. <laughs> oh, that's funny, isn't it? <laughs> you know, that's hilarious. <clears throat> But you, you talk the way you've been. And here's my point. If you've been hanging around with Jesus, you talk like Jesus. His mind, his mind is filling your mind, and, and you're beginning to think his thoughts after him, and your whole worldview. Do you ever stand around in our culture and go, wow, this is not me? I don't think the way these people think. I, my worldview is so radically different. I'm a fish out of water in this culture anymore as it continues to become more and more post-Christian. Amen? Secondly, the right mind has contact with God's desires. Contact with God's desires. Two key words here. He said, I pray that God will fill you with the knowledge of His will. Two key words, knowledge and will. You see, biblically speaking, knowledge has a connotation of experiential knowledge or of intimacy. The Bible said that Adam knew his wife and she conceived. There was intimacy in that, you know. It, is, it has this idea that there is intimacy going on between you and the Lord. So I pray that you will be filled with knowledge of His will, that you will have intimate contact with the desires of God. That there will be an intimate experiential event goes on where you and the desires of God are connecting. And the heart of God, the will of God, the purpose of God. A spiritual mind has intimate contact with what God wants. 
few days ago, I, I was enjoying, I, I hope that this doesn't offend any of you. If it does, you need to pray through and get saved. Uh, but I was, I was enjoying some, some target practice, and, and I was shooting a, a rather loud AR-15 that I was blessed with. And uh, I noticed even with the earplugs in, you know, it, my, my ears, it kind of hurt my ears a little bit. So I, I went in the house and, and I said to my wife, in a few days, the kids are going to call you and say, what does daddy want for Father's Day? Because they have a theory that you and I spend a lot of time together and that you will know what my desires are. Are you tracking with me, guys? And when they call you and say, what does dad want? Tell them, I want some of those weird-looking earmuffs that go over your ears when you're shooting, that protect your ears, you know, so that, you know, I may even do it riding a lawnmower. Wouldn't that look geeky out there, you know, <laughs> to, to protect my ears? Because, you know this, all the time, if, if you want to get something for someone, you try to find someone that knows them intimately. Hey, what does, well, I'm going to buy them a present. What do they want? Because you have this idea that if they're living close together, they know what each other like. They know what each other want. And you get my point now. When you are living close to God, you are filled with the knowledge of His desires. We all get obsessed with the will of God, the will of God, the will of God. But the will of God, if you read it, Directly in the original text, the Greek language, it literally says, I pray that God will, uh, the Spirit will fill you with the knowledge of what God wants. I pray that God will fill you with the knowledge of what God wants. What does He want for you? Is that the, the orientation of your life? Is your greatest desire to know what God wants? Would you like to hear a story? No? I thought you liked my stories. I thought you liked them better than the sermons. I'm going to force a story on you anyway then. Back in September of 1977... I stepped to the pulpit for the very first time as a three-year-old. <laughs> and I preached my very first sermon. I was 16 years old. I preached my very first sermon. A few years later, I graduated high school. And I had this, and I'd been preaching at least once a week ever since then. And have probably ever since then, since September of 1976. Wow, that's, that's, I'm coming up on an anniversary. Don't forget, you know, this September. Um, I remember when I graduated high school, I was called, I was anointed, and I was ignorant. I was called, I was anointed, and I was ignorant. I mean, I knew quite a bit of scripture for a a 19, 18, 19 year old, because I read the Bible, you know, like crazy, but there's a lot I didn't know, but I, I still thought I knew enough to do whatever I needed to do. And so I went and got a job at a factory, and I didn't stop to think, God, is this what you want for me? I just thought, this is what I've got to do. Went and got a job at a factory, and, and back then, Mr. Reagan was the president. Remember Ronald Reagan? I started to do an imitation, but I can't remember anything he said. You know, um, uh, and we were we were working in the factory. We were building lenses for submarine telescopes, and, and we were working crazy hours. And all of a sudden, we lost the contract. I mean, I just got hired in, got set up, and I, we lost the contract, and I got laid off. So. I reloaded, I went uh, 20 miles in the other direction, I got a job working at Skill, making saws. Oh, 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 you know, I was making those circular saws, and I was putting those things together. I hired in two weeks later, 
the boss came and said, uh, sorry guys, we lost the contract. All you guys that were hired two weeks ago, this is your last day. I said, son of a gun! <laughs> so I went and hired on at a, at a, a, a Mennonite. He was, he was um, building houses. So I went and hired on with the Mennonites and I learned quite a bit of carpentry work. And, but it just seemed like and this went on for five years, trying to figure out, and then I had this brilliant idea at the end of the fifth year. Brilliant idea. It was amazing. You know what it was? Maybe I should ask God what he wants for my life. Isn't it brilliant? Maybe I should ask God what he wants me to do with my life. And that began the process of turning my life around and dedicating my life full time into the ministry. That decision where my wife and I are praying about it and literally I, I honestly have to give her the credit for coming up and saying, have you thought of this? Have you thought that God she didn't say it. She did said it a lot nicer, but she, but but essentially, have you ever thought that God may want to get rid of some of your ignorance? You know, she didn't say that. She said, "Do you think maybe you should get some more education? <laughs> do Do you think maybe you should, you know?" And that was the beginning of me giving my life. Now I preached all the time anyway. It was, it was, I didn't change who I was and who God called me to be. I changed the process of trying to figure out what is my path that God wants me to walk on. Paul is praying for you, and this is just really weird. It's just weird, as weird as you are. It's, it's just weird. that He wants to fill you with the knowledge of his will. Not just have a little sampling, but for your mind to absolutely be filled up with the knowledge of God's will. Wouldn't it be radical if a bunch of believers started walking through their life full of the knowledge of God's will? You know what you'd quit doing? You'd quit wandering around through life hoping things work out. You'd quit stumbling down this path and stumbling down that path and waking up one day and say, wow, what's wrong with me? You would actually have a sustained, strategic, progression of God's purpose flowing through you. Is this making sense? Come on. I pray that God would fill you with the knowledge of His will. I pray that you just be filled up with that, that no more are you chasing whatever rainbow and dream you've got out in front of you, and you're just simply full of the knowledge of God's desires. What an incredible The right mind is achieved through spiritual wisdom. Spiritual wisdom, he said. I pray that he will fill you with knowledge of his will through all spiritual wisdom. The Greek word for wisdom is Sophia. You ever heard of that? Sophia. And Sophia in the original language means mental excellence. In its highest and fullest sense. Mental excellence in its highest and fullest sense. Now, I want to practice here for a minute. I want you to go, uh huh. Everybody, uh huh. Now, I want you to use that in just a moment. You ready? I'll point at you. Not yet. I'm going to point at you. All right, you ready? Have you ever seen a believer? do a really stupid thing. Isn't this fun? It gets a little tougher now. Have you ever, as a believer, done something incredibly stupid? Oh, even more em emphasis there. It's because your life can... Listen, 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 listen. Your life can never... Rise higher than the level of your thinking. Your life can never rise higher 
than the level of your thinking. If you keep living without wisdom, spiritual wisdom, your life can never overcome that. I have a, a window into things that I, I can't share with you, and, and I'm not going to turn into an illustration for fear that I'd scare people to death, but I, I'm telling you that on a weekly basis, I meet with people and I talk with people and I try to help people pick up the pieces of some very unwise decisions. And sometimes I wonder, how do believers make such incompatible decisions? How do, how do they do that? How can they be walking with the Lord and experiencing the Lord and be so foolish in some of the decisions that we make? And that's why Paul is here talking to the holy and faithful brothers and sisters. And he's saying, I pray that God will fill you with the knowledge of His will through all spiritual wisdom. Can I be just a little sarcastic and say, wise up, <laughs> wise up. Don't be living in that unwise place. Wise up. At this level of thinking, you are elevated into the realm of God's desires. Wisdom, true wisdom, elevates your thinking up to the realm of God's desires. So now I'm walking through my life with my mind full of God's desires and I have the excellence of thinking by means of the Holy Spirit to make decisions that are based in that wisdom and not in the ignorance of human wisdom. And they all said, isn't this kind of tough? I mean, I mean isn't this kind of like spiritual algebra we're doing today? Isn't it? Does it kind of make your head hurt? Number four, we obtain the right mind through spiritual understanding. It makes a difference between wisdom and understanding. Understanding, he takes two Greek words, puts, puts them together to send and with, and somehow that comes out meaning when our thoughts come together. When our thoughts come together. If you understand what I'm saying today, our thoughts have come together. I've taken a concept that the Lord has helped me to develop in my mind. I've communicated it with words, and you've understood it, and we have an understanding going on here. Our thoughts have joined God's thoughts, and we have understanding. Our lives truly possess the will of God when we join His thoughts. Think about it. Our minds truly possess the will of God when we join His thoughts. And we begin to think His thoughts after Him. He has thoughts. He's not ambivalent toward me, not ambivalent toward you. We're thinking God's thoughts after Him. All right, let's roll into the next point. You got that one, didn't you? You must live a life that is worthy. You must live a worthy life. I believe the word worthy there actually means consistent, compatible. It says, and we pray this. What do we do? We pray everything we just prayed. You know, what we talked about. We pray this in order that you may live a life worthy of the Lord. Now, please get this. When your thoughts are filled with God's desires, then you can live a life that is worthy of the Lord. In other words, a life that is consistent with who you are in Christ. That you can live a life worthy of the Lord and may please Him. What's that? That's the desires of God. That you may please Him in every way. Now, how are you going to please Him in every way? I'm glad you asked. Here's how. Bearing fruit in every good work. Growing in the knowledge of God being strengthened with all power according to His glorious might, so that you may have great endurance and patience and joyfully giving thanks. Is this getting bogged down? To the Father who has qualified you to share the inheritance of the saints in the kingdom of light. I pray this. Now, we're going to take that apart, so if you got lost, don't worry about it. And uh, let's, let's start doing that right now. 
your worthy life. What, how does your worthy life look? Let's talk about this. A worthy life is consistent with your spiritual identity. A life that honors Jesus' sacrifice. I'm going to jump out of Colossians for just a moment. You remember in Hebrews, I'm sure you do, where Paul talks about, or whoever the writer of Hebrews was, it's an anonymous book, but he talks about that some people fell away, and in the process of falling away from God, what did they do? They walked the blood of Jesus under their feet, he said. They walked the blood of Jesus under their feet. In order to get away from him, they had to walk his blood under their feet. So when we're living a life consistent with your identity, you're honoring the blood of Jesus. If Jesus died to set me free from sin, then I'm going to live a life of freedom from that bondage, and that's the way I honor the blood that set me free. Amen? That's the way I honor it. Is this just too heavy? You won't believe some of your facial expressions. I need to take pictures, send them back to you. Jesus designed you to have a lifestyle that confirms his presence and power in you. He wants you to have a lifestyle that confirms, that's what we're being worthy of, that confirms that his presence and power is in you. Now, if you signed up for my Coffee Talk class, which you have to if you're going to get to heaven... uh, if you signed up for my Coffee Talk class, one of the classes I teach once in a while is on leadership, how to be a good spiritual leader. Lesson number one, in case you don't have time to go there. You ready? Lesson number one on being a spiritual leader. Ready? This is, this is what I say. When I gather people around who aspire to be leaders, lesson number one in spiritual leadership, you have to suffer well. You have to suffer well. If your faith cannot hold up under adversity and devastation and disappointment, you can't lead anybody. It's when you're going through those terrible times and the world, your world seems to be falling apart that God stabilizes you and you walk it out in faithfulness. Now there's credibility. Anybody can serve God on the mountaintop. Anybody can serve God when there's a lot of money left over at the end of the bill paying, right? Anybody can serve God when when they're going downhill and with the wind. But who can serve God when things get really tough, when someone you love betrays you, when your finances are very difficult, when your physical health is not what you want it to be? Who can stand up and say, praise God, God is awesome in those bad times? That's who your spiritual leaders are. You've got to be able to suffer well. Now, that, I just pulled that a little bit out of context, but to say that God designs you to have a lifestyle that confirms his power and presence in you. If you can't go through trials, then you don't have the power and presence of God in you. You know, And they all said... Number two, a worthy life is pleasing to the Lord. Listen. I'm saying that a lot, aren't I? Listen, listen, listen. Jesus would not die for you and then become ambivalent about you. Right? Jesus would not give the ultimate sacrifice for you and then say, oh, whatever, whatever happens to you, that's, that's, your, that's your deal. He has a very strong opinion about your life. You can ask my kids. I'm very opinionated about their lives. <laughs> I have an opinion about everything they do. I try to not always share it unless they're in the in earshot of me. You know, I'm really I'm really not overbearing, but I have such a investment of love in them. I have to have a strong opinion about them. 
Let me ask you a question. Are you obsessed with what Jesus wants for you? Obsessed with it. Not, oh, it'd be kind of nice to know what God wants. No, no, that's not it. That's being lukewarm. Or not even lukewarm. Are you obsessed with it? I want to be the kind of believer that constantly says, God, what do you want? Every crossroad, stop. God, what do you want? Every decision, God, what's your purpose here? You have a, a very strong opinion about the direction I go. You died for me. You're my father. You want something here in this decision. There is a direction you want me to go. I am obsessed with understanding what that is. Friends, don't write your own script and expect God to bless it. Don't do your own thing and expect God to sign off on it. That's not the way fathers operate. We don't do that. A worthy life bears fruit. He says, bearing fruit in every good work. Here, fruit is a metaphor. Now, don't, don't confuse this fruit with the fruit of Galatians 5, and 23. The love, joy, peace, temperance. That's not the same kind of fruit. This is the fruit of every good work. Here's this, here's this radical idea. <laughs> Are you ready? That we should actually be working for the Lord. What? That there's stuff we should be doing for God. And that that stuff. Is creating impact. That stuff is creating impact. A worthy life bears fruit. You have an assignment from God. Don't quit on me yet. I'm, I'm hurrying. You have an assignment for God. From God. Our lives were designed to be a continual source of impact for God. You are to be a witness, you are to be a comfort, you are to be a support to other people, and that's supposed to constantly, in one way or another, be flowing out of you. Amen? What if you began to see your life as a constant source of God's impact? What if tomorrow morning, when you head off to work, your assignment is to impact people for Jesus. What if? What if you're looking around you, just wondering, who in your life can you touch for God and make an image? I think that's what he's talking about, the fruit of every good work, that we're constantly working for God. We need workers around here. We need people in nursery. We need people teaching classes. We, yeah, we need all that. And believe me, sign up. The app is there. Sign up. But working for God just doesn't take place in the church building. In fact, most of God's work takes place outside of church. When a nurse quietly prays for a patient, and he or she may not even know what's going on. When a teacher quietly prays for a student who's struggling or going through a difficult time or touches a child or a young adult for Jesus. I always say my favorite teacher of all time when I was in second grade, it is going to surprise you, I was one of the shorter kids. Let's go ahead, have your fun. God will deal with you. I remember I was going through a difficult time because there was, um, you know, some bigger kids and they thought it was funny to beat up the other kid that wasn't as big. And, and I remember I'd go to school dreading facing these maniacs on the playground. But I'll never forget Ann Martin used to meet me on the sidewalk when I'd get to school. And she'd put her arms around me and she would hold me. Second grade. I was, I was only a foot tall, but, you know, it was, I was in the second grade. And I, I never forgot Ann Martin. You, we're friends on Facebook now. Every once in a while, I'll send her, hey, my favorite teacher. You, can you have any idea how long ago it was when I was in the second grade? Shut up. <laughs> uh, but she made an impact. And she's, she is a believer. She made an impact 
on a second grader forever, stepping in there and showing love and kindness. When you go to your job tomorrow, there may be someone in the next cubicle or at the next desk or the next machine whose life is falling apart. What about you? Step in. Step in. Step in. That the fruit of every good work would be coming out of you. That This is what a spiritual person does. i got to hurry. A worthy life is advancing in the knowledge of God. There's this advancement going on. Growing in the knowledge of God. There is this growing intimacy that is going on between you and the Lord. This growing personal experience between you and the Lord. I pray that you'll have biblical knowledge, but I kind of think that's not what this is talking about. Because knowledge of God is not just biblical facts. It's what the Holy Spirit is doing in your life. And it's what you're witnessing God doing. And you put biblical knowledge and the work of the Holy Spirit and what you're witnessing and you put those together and I think you have understanding. You have understanding. It's not just words on a page anymore. It's, it's something the Holy Spirit is doing. It's something you are witnessing happening. And so now you have understanding. You see, this is so much different than the modern concept of Christianity where you run to church and you get inspired and you go back out and you live the way you lived last week. This is the thing where you go out and you in, impact your world by God's strength and grace. A worthy life is a life of power. Being strengthened in the power of His might, he says. It's an ongoing thing, a participle. It's going on by the might. In other words, you're unstoppable. And because of that, you have great endurance and you have patience and you have joy. Great endurance. In other words, you can't be stopped. The enemy can bring the host of hell against you, but you're going to still be standing because you have the power of His might working in you. Right? That's what Paul is talking about here, that there's a work going on in you. You have great endurance, so you can push through anything life deals you because the Holy Spirit is creating the power of His might within you. And you have patience. Now, biblically speaking, patience doesn't mean that I can sit around and wait on you and not get frustrated. That's impossible. Uh, but patience, again, I'm sorry for all the language, say, but patience... The, the Greek word is upo meno. Upo means under, meno means to remain. Patience is the ability to hold up under something. I'm holding something up and I'm okay. That's biblical patience. In other words, this weight up here getting kind of tough. I, I, maybe I shouldn't do a poll right now, but, but probably many of you are wishing when a trial you're going through right now was over. And one day it will be over. And we pray God hastens that day. Amen. But until then, you have patience. You're not going to cash it in. You're not going to lose faith. You're not going to abandon God because the power of His Spirit is in you creating the ability to hold up under pressure. Joy. This is what keeps the thrill in it. This is, this is what makes this life so wonderful. Aren't you glad that you don't have to go to Colorado and buy some medical marijuana to survive? Aren't you glad? <laughs> the way some of you are laughing, I, I, maybe, you've, maybe you do do that, you know? I want to be a person. I'll always strive to be the person that people say, we had a lot of laughs with that guy. We had a lot of laughs with that guy. I think we're supposed to be happy. I don't want to be of that crowd that's just hoping Jesus comes back today because they can't survive another day. I want to be of that group that says, if Jesus comes back, glory, hallelujah, but if he doesn't, tomorrow's going to be great. 
we're going to really have a good time tomorrow. Amen? That's the strength of God. One last point, and we're done for the day. A worthy life overflows with gratitude. He said, giving thanks. I want to tell you something that you may have forgotten in your present trial. So listen very carefully. If you listen real careful, I'll let you go. When I get done. Um, as you are being... Let me, let me reword that. This, this is my closing sprint to it. Are you ready? If God never did another thing for you, he would still be worthy of your gratitude. If he never answered another prayer, the fact that you get to go to heaven is enough to praise him forever. It's enough to praise him forever. Not long ago, I, I was standing in, on the property that my wife and I now own down in Arkansas. It's a property I grew up on. When my mom and dad passed. It's a long story, but we wound up with it. And I was standing in the living room, and I was just had a moment of just thinking oh, when I was in that living room with mom and dad. And it was just kind of that moment of going, man, they're gone. And, and I had this thought. I won't call it a vision because then you might think I'm weird. But I had this thought that there's just this circle appeared and, and you could kind of see through it and see mom and dad and all the other loved ones on the other side having a great time. And it was almost like you could just walk up and crawl through that hole and be there with them. And that is the hope of eternal life. And if God doesn't give me anything else, I believe he will. But if he doesn't give me anything else in this life, his promise that he has provided for my eternal future is enough for me to praise him forever. I know your trial is painful. I know things are tough. Don't stop praising him. Don't stop thanking him. Don't think because he hasn't fixed this, you don't have anything to be thankful for. You've got a million years worth of praising already you're indebted to him. Right? Don't stop. Because a spiritual mind can't stay spiritual unless it stays grateful. A spiritual mind can't stay spiritual unless it stays grateful. Amen? Amen. Stand with me, please. I sort of jokingly said, I've got my work cut out for me today. But it's really true. Our minds are bent to the left, and God's trying to bend them to the right. It's called transformation. God wants your mind to be completely transformed and to be filled with the knowledge of God's desire. Friends, if you'd be really honest today, you'd probably say, my mind is full of my desires. There's a lot of stuff I want, and my mind is full of what I want. In fact, so full, there may not even be any room for God's desires. I appeal to you in the name of Jesus. Transform that. Purge your mind of all the stuff. It's unworthy of you. It's unworthy of the price that was paid for you. Purge yourself, yourself of your desires and become obsessed with 
what God wants for you. Because that's life. That's abundance. That's what you want. If you don't mind, just reach over and put your hand on the shoulder or take the hand of the person next to you. I want you to pray for that person, for those people. Lord, push out my desires. Push out her desires. Push out his desires. Clean this mind out and make room for it to be filled with the desires of God. Lord, I pray that my brother, I pray that my sister will become obsessed. Obsessed with your desires, with your will. I pray that they will wake up praying for your will. I pray they'd lay down praying for your will. I pray that multiple times throughout the day they would ask for a revelation of your will. Please, Lord. Transform our minds into a mind that is filled with the knowledge of your will. And Father, if there's anyone here today who does not know you as Lord and Savior, I pray, Lord, that you would give them the faith right now to believe in their heart and confess with their mouth that Jesus is Lord of their life, that they would know that the sacrifice you paid is enough and they would accept that as payment in full, and they would confess now that you are Lord of their life. In Jesus' name, amen.